Hello, this is Joe Trahan welcoming you to the All Me Podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, whose mission is to enlighten the world to the truths about appearance and performance-enhancing substances. As the national leader on this subject, they communicate their educational messages through various methods, including this podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the All Me Podcast. This is Don Hooten Jr. and today I'll be your host. Over the past couple of years, we have really focused on how to achieve all of your physical goals by providing information on nutrition. This year, we're going to focus on bringing you the world's experts on strength and conditioning. Today, we're going to be talking with Jose Vasquez, who has been a Major League Baseball strength and conditioning coach for many years. Currently, he's serving as the Major League Strength Coach for the Texas Rangers. Our discussion today is about usable strength. You might be asking yourself, what is usable strength? Well, you're going to have to stay tuned to the interview to learn why it's so important for all of us, not just athletes. Jose has worked hard his entire life to better himself and consume every last bit of knowledge that he can. We will talk about how this leadership trait has helped him get where he is today and how he uses this work ethic and knowledge to help develop young players. It was really cool to hear about how Jose obtained his black belt in jujitsu and learning that it was one of the biggest accomplishments in his life. Jose is a member of the Professional Baseball Strength Conditioning Coaches Society, who's a partner of the Taylor Hooten Foundation, and we're so thankful for their years of support please consider making a donation to the Taylor Hooten Foundation to help support our all-me education programs. Let's bring Texas Rangers Major League Strength and Conditioning Coach onto the show. Jose, welcome to the All Me Podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is awesome, man. I'm so excited to get to talk to you, and and it's really been great getting to know you over the years. Uh, Time sure does fly. Just so for our listeners, you are the Texas Rangers Major League Strength and Conditioning Coach, which really means you've made it to the top of your profession. And I'm sure that wasn't an easy path, nor it was a job that was just handed to you. So what I'd like to start by doing is just talk about your background and get to know who you are, where you're from, and and really what got you interested in this world of strength and conditioning. Uh, yes, well, I'll, I'll start with, I guess, first where I'm from. I am originally from Puerto Rico, and, um, you know, I grew up playing sports like most kids. I always had this desire to figure out how to get better. And so whether it was skill or strength or fitness or whatever I could get my hands on, whatever I thought would help me become a better athlete, I looked into. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, if, if I think back at how I started, I just had this curiosity about, you know, how do I get better? And so I ran into a lot of a lot of things that I ran into early on was fitness, weight training, bodybuilding. Most of my interest seemed to be to gravitate toward uh, weight training. And so I, as far back as I can remember, as a little kid in Puerto Rico, I that that was the thing that attracted me was the weights. But I moved to Miami, Miami, Florida when I was 12 years old in 1982. And uh, again, joined sports teams. I played soccer, I played wrestling, I played baseball, played football, but mostly baseball and football. And through football, I I learned the structure of weight training. Mm -hmm. I learned the connection between weight training and sport. Football is a sport that traditionally from the very beginning, when you're a little kid, you you line up and you do push-ups and you do sprints and you jump and you cut and you do things that lead you to believe that that's kind of where uh, where your success is going to come from is from your training and so that idea always appealed to me that there is a certain amount of preparation that goes into your sport whereas baseball when I was a kid, it was just pick up the ball, start throwing, start swinging the bat and you warm up as you go. And so the structure, the discipline that from football is what got me interested in strength and conditioning in the first place. For those that are listening, you know, you're now in major league baseball. So you're working with big league players every day as a strength and conditioning coach. 
what sort of schooling did you have to have and, and sort of what was that path that led you to, uh, you know, the position that you're in today? Because as I know, just working in professional sports, uh, you know, these are jobs that don't open up all the time. Uh, you know, sometimes you just have to wait your turn. So, you know, that's, I just would love your kind of your perspective of, you know, what led you to your success to where you are today. Yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll tell you my, my story because it's not very, uh, uh, it's not something that I could tell somebody, Hey, do it like me. <laughs> but, uh, my education really started again for, because I was curious about fitness. I wanted to know how to be, I was at the university of Tennessee and I wanted to know, what it took to become a better baseball player. And so I, my major became exercise science. And so because of that, I, I really dove into figuring out how to lift weights properly, how to eat properly. And, and, and I started to learn about all the things that uh, lead to becoming an athlete. And uh, so I majored in exercise science from the university of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I went on to play minor league baseball for a few years and then when I got out of baseball, I, I wanted to do a job that has something to do with fitness, strength and conditioning. Back then, strength and conditioning wasn't very popular. Only big universities and NFL teams had football teams had strength coaches. So there wasn't much in the, in, in the strength and conditioning world. So I didn't know which way to go. And so through searching what else to do, I decided to do a master's in physical therapy. I right. thought, well, I still like exercise. I like helping people. So I went on to get a master's in physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And um, as I began to, after I graduated from physical therapy, I began to work with kids at night at a baseball facility. And I started to put all of it together. I started to put together the rehab ideas that I was that I learned from physical therapy, putting my baseball experience, putting my strength and conditioning knowledge at the time into into use. And um, I realized that I really liked it. I, I realized that I I wanted to get out of the clinic and I enjoyed working with the kids. I enjoyed working with the athletes a lot more than being in a clinic 40 hours a week. And so I began a kind of a journey of networking, traveling, calling on experts, anyone that I could find that I was interested in. I would call them. I would visit them. I would take their seminar. I would buy the seminar. Anything, anything that I can get my hands on, I, I pursued. And so at the time I was coaching, I was helping coach a high school in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Tom House came to do a pitching clinic and so mm -hmm. i i always at the time he was very popular for his uh training with pitchers pitching by mechanics uh as everybody knows he was nolan's uh pitching coach here in texas mm -hmm. and so i went to the clinic looking to strike up a conversation and pick his brain about training and pitching and all that and but that conversation led to uh a job with the New York Mets. Uh, we struck up a conversation uh, when he realized my background and, and what I'd done in the past. He realized, man, you'd be perfect for Major League Baseball. And long story short, he passed my name along to Bobby Ballantyne, and, who was a manager with the Mets at the time. And, and through that connection, I got an interview. The trainers liked me. The GM liked me. And so they gave me a job as an assistant strength coach with the New York Mets. So wow. uh, kind of wrapping it up, uh, it was one of those things where I was at the right place at the right time, but I also look back at the efforts that I, yeah. you know, put forth. I had the education, I had a, a bachelor's in exercise science, a master's in physical therapy. I spent at that time, I guess it was two, two and a half years of traveling, networking, taking seminars, mm -hmm. meeting people. So I, I was hustling. I was hustling to, to get as much knowledge as I as I could. And so, you know, when the opportunity opened up, I had the education, I had the knowledge, I had the energy, the ambition. And so I just I just took it and ran with it. 
That's awesome. I, I don't even know if I knew that whole story or not, but that's really cool. And that's just a good life lesson is never stop hustling. I mean, you know, I always tell people just visit with as many people as you can. I mean, everybody's unique in their own way, but you never know who you're talking to, uh, you know, and, and people can see that too, especially somebody like you that's that's worked really hard to get where you are. And, and you know, one of the messages you keep saying is you're always hungry for more and more and more information to try to better yourself, which is cool. Now, one of the things I'm not sure that's super well known about you is that you're a black belt in jujitsu. What got you interested in that particular martial art? And how do you have time with your, your full-time job to participate in such a martial art to work your way to the top of that sport as well? Yeah, that's a, honestly, it's, it's one of my, I feel like it's one of my biggest accomplishments of all the things that I've ever done. Uh, but uh, as a kid, I was always interested in the martial arts because martial arts require a lot of training, discipline, focus. That is also one of the sports that I, I realize I like those disciplines. I like those things that martial arts have to offer, the focus, the strength, the discipline, the agility, the power. Mm -hmm. And so all those things kind of appeal to me. But, you know, at the time when I was a kid, it, they, they weren't real sports. So it was kind of a side thing that you did. And so I didn't have time. But I always had that, that desire to mm -hmm. get my black belt in some kind of martial art. And so... When I joined the Rangers, I always feel, and I always recommend this to every staff member in, 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 in pro sports, you have to have a hobby. You have to find something to detach from your job. Otherwise, it consumes your, your every day, your, your whole life. Mm, yeah. And so I, I wanted to do some martial arts. And, again, and so as I traveled to different cities with the team, I went to a class. I, I, I guess I'll tell you, this is an interesting story how I started. Mm -hmm. So... I took Hank Blaylock to yeah. a gym in Kansas City. And, um, you know, so we in the morning, sometimes I take players to work out on the road. And and so I took him to work out and I saw a, a sign on the on the board there, uh, MMA Jiu Jitsu lessons. And it had a number. And I thought, you know what, let me try this stuff. So I called the guy. And so I came the next day and took a lesson. And it was the biggest butt kicking of my life. I, I, I thought I was going to die. And so I, I, I remember walking away. I said, you know what? This is awesome. And so I, from the, that second on, I, I, got, I got hooked. And so I started to, everywhere I traveled, I started to look for gyms. I would call ahead and get a lesson. And then I'd come home and get a lesson. And I, as I traveled, I just kept getting lessons. And so it was not as linear as most people you know they just go three times a week and you know they stay mm -hmm. in the same school and but for me it, it took it took 10 years okay it took 10 years to learn to to deal with the injuries to you know to persevere because the one thing that i tell people that i learned from jujitsu is the ability to learn the ability to take failure and turn it into a into a lesson the one thing that jujitsu teaches you, and, and and I I hear this all the time, and it's now when I hear people talk about jujitsu and and I and I think back at the way I felt back then and the way they feel now, people always say, you know, you you learn how to fail and you get beat nine times out of ten. But that one time that you do win that sparring match, it is so rewarding because you think back out of all the other nine times that you got tapped out and submitted. Mm -hmm. You, you walk away realizing, man, now I know why I did that. And a lot of times, the reason people don't learn from their failures is because they get so overwhelmed and they get so upset that they failed that their mind is not right to receive the lesson that failure brings. Every time you fail at something, if you keep the right mindset, if you keep the right uh, perspective and you sit back and you reflect, you will learn something. And jujitsu humbles you every time you mm -hmm. get on that mat and you get beat by somebody younger or some or somebody uh, of a lesser belt. It is a humbling experience. And so you learn to be humble and then you sit back and you say, well, I shouldn't have put my hand there or I should have done this or I should have mm -hmm. done that. And that right there, you can take that into your everyday life. Remain calm, remain, you know, remain true to what you're trying to do. 
and don't let the failure overwhelm you so that you can walk away with a lesson. And so, again, I go back to the saying, I learned how to learn. And I that is something that I took with me. And I don't practice as much. I've, I have sustained many injuries because of it. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. So I just I like to right now teach people and help people get through the the grind of it. But I think it's, it was a wonderful journey of self motivation. Uh, it inspired me. I met a lot of good people. A lot of met a lot of professional fighters that at the time were famous. And, and I learned a lot about myself, how I handle failure. And I learned how to, how to just keep going when I didn't feel like it, when I was hurting, when I was tired, it, it, it taught me so many things that I wish I had this kind of mindset when I was younger, I, I maybe it would have helped me more, maybe not, but I know that uh, the lessons that I learned from jujitsu is something that I pass along to my players, to my kids. It is something that, unless you experience, it's hard to it's hard to explain. But the accomplishment of getting a black belt, it's a big deal because it's a lot. It's not only physical and, and when it comes to pain, but it's it's a it's a mind it's a mind grind. It 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 challenges your mind, your body, your spirit to keep going until you get that black belt. It, it was very satisfying to get a black belt. That's yeah, that's, that's a huge accomplishment. Thanks for sharing that story. And that, that's what I was actually going to ask you is just with some of the messages you've learned and the things that you've learned through that sport, you work around a lot of young guys, a lot of young guys, you know, some of them still that have, aren't even 21 years old. So I'm sure some of those messages that you have when, when you're working with these guys on a day-to-day -day basis definitely transpires in a conversation that you might be having in the weight room or on the field, especially during a season, uh, you know, when in baseball, especially as a hitter, you fail a lot. Uh, and it's just something I'm sure that you're able to, to pass on to them. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, I try to do as much as I can. I want to put, I like to put myself in that player's shoes. Uh, you know, as a, as a player, as a baseball player, obviously I, I failed enough that I did not make it to the big leagues. So I know, but I know what it is like to strike out. I know what it's like to make an error. I know what it's like to lose the game. So at least I have a little bit of that. Not, not, not at the same level as the big leagues, but I have a little bit of that. Also, listening to those guys, watching them prepare, watching them succeed, watching them fail. I would always try to put myself in that mindset of failure, just like, like I was describing in jiu-jitsu. Everything that I teach these guys, I try to expose myself to it. So when I prescribe a workout, when I do uh, prescribe a certain exercise, I try it myself. Mm -hmm. I, I try to make sure I, I know what it feels. I know it, where it hurts. I, I try to... I try to imagine myself, okay, if if I played seven days in a row, how would this workout feel? And so I try to experience as much as I can before I prescribe it to them. It's almost like tasting the food before I give it to them, make sure it's not poisoned. So every my every message, every, everything that I try to do with my players, I always try to feel it myself first before I offer it so that I so that they know that I care. They know that I can empathize because I've done it before mm. or I've experienced it before. I, I don't ever, I, I try not to come from the standpoint of do what I say without any experience. I like mm -hmm. to experience it. I want to show them that I have experienced it before, you know, so that I, I have a little bit more weight to what I'm saying and, and, mm -hmm. and perhaps create a little more, uh, credibility for me so that they trust me yeah. because if if they don't trust me it's not going to get done and so i try to take all this all these lessons all these stories i try to put it all in in, in perspective for them so that hopefully i can encourage that player at that moment to help them keep going to help them uh learn that that lesson to to be able to get past their you know anxiety anger worry whatever so that I can help them. If I can get them, if I can help them get past that, then they can learn from their mistakes and, and just move on. That's that's because that's the other thing you got. You got to you got to get uh, overcome your anger, your frustration. Take, you know, get one or two things that you can improve on and then turn the page and move on. Otherwise, you don't you don't you don't improve.
Yeah, you got to have a short term memory. And that's those are true words spoken from a leader. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're not going to ask any of your guys to do anything that you haven't tried. And once they know that, again, like you said, I mean, they've got your trust. It's like, okay, you know, Jose's done this before. He's tried this out. He's not going to steer me down a wrong path or he's just not telling me to do it just to make me do it. There's a reason behind it. And here on the All Me podcast, you know, we've talked a lot about how to achieve your physical goals the right way. You, you know, my brother's story, you know, the Taylor Hooten Foundation story. And we've covered a lot of information on nutrition and dietary supplements. But what I'd like to pick your brain on and the knowledge that you've acquired over your long career uh, is really to focus on usable strength. So I guess the big question a lot of people are probably asking is what is usable strength? So let's start there. Yeah. So the usable strength is a term that I use, it, it has become my perspective over the years, observing training, training players, succeeding in some areas, failing in some areas. It's a term that I've kind of come up with. And so the, the way I, I, I explain it is, is the ability to control your body during functional activities. What is a functional activity? Well, it depends on who you are. You know, a functional activity for a baseball player is to hit the baseball, to run the bases, to pitch, to, you know, if it's an elderly person, a functional activity is to get out of bed, to get off of a chair. So the thing that, uh, and I know for the strength and conditioning people, this is kind of like a duh, but the reason I make a big deal out of this is because a lot of, a lot of guys and a lot of people think that strength is, uh, is something that you do across the board and it's just automatically turned into it's going to automatically help your sport or help you move better. And that's, that's completely off. One story that I tell people is when I was, I want to say sophomore year in college. So I, that, that year, I, you know, I, well, yeah, I, I was transferring to Tennessee and it was the summer between my sophomore year and my junior year. And I was playing summer ball, but I was lifting like a madman six days a week. I, I was big, strong. I was squatting heavy. I, I, I felt the strongest part. I mean, as all get up. I mean, I, I was muscular. I looked good. And then I remember hitting a double or not. Well, it, was, it wasn't a double. I remember just crushing this pitch into the left center gap and it hit the wall and it's, and it sat there and I'm like rounding first thinking, oh, an easy double. I'm just running as hard as I can. Cause it, it was, it was hard hit. So I, I thought, you know, I better hustle. And I'm rounding first base and the second baseman already has the ball. And it was one of those aha moments when I said, wait a minute, I am slow. Wow. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm doing something wrong because if I can't run fast, then I'm not doing myself any good. And I realized that when I thought, I thought back at the training that I was doing, I was training like a bodybuilder. So I was doing a lot of reps, a lot of heavy weights, uh, six days a week. And on top of that, I was trying to play baseball. And yeah, my muscles were growing, but they were getting slower. And so I couldn't run. And so I, I, I told myself, well, you know, if I can't run, then what is this strength that I have? What is it good for? And I realized there's something wrong with this. At the time, you know, I was 20 years old. I, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know, you know, most of my information was coming out of Muscle and Fitness magazine. But I realized there's something wrong with this weight training. And I just, so what I would do every year, I would train really hard in the off season. And during the season, I wouldn't train so that all my muscles would loosen up and I become more pliable and, and, and I would play. And, but I realized this training is not right. So, you know, the, the thing that people need to think about is the definition of strength is, is a measure of force. Every movement that we make requires a certain amount of force, some movements more than others. So to pick up a glass of water, it requires some force, but it's very light. And your muscle and brain, your brain has to tell your muscles to fire at a, at a certain rate of speed in order for you to grab that glass of water and not spill it. Same thing with hitting a baseball. Your muscles need to fire at a certain rate of speed to hit that baseball. So getting back to like what, the, what I mean by all of this is every athlete has to have 
be able to evaluate what they're doing. Whatever their training is, whatever they, they have chosen to do, they have to really ask themselves, am I moving well? Am I accomplishing what I'm trying to do on what I'm trying to accomplish on the field? I've, I have been around a lot of players that kill themselves in the weight room and they're trying and they're doing this and they're doing that. And they go out and pitch and they're losing velocity. They go out and, and, and run and they feel slow and they feel tight. And, you know, in my, my comment to them is like, is what you're doing working for you? Don't you think you need to adjust some things, change some things? Oh, no, but, you know, this is what I feel like I need to do. You know, and so through my experience, my personal experience, through the experience of a lot of players that can, you know, <laughs> that are not very compliant, I have learned that you can develop all kinds of strength, but it's not usable. You can't use it on the field because you're not you're not su succeeding. And so, for for the people that are you know trying to figure out, okay, what does he mean by usable strength? Usable strength is are you moving correctly? Is your preparation improving your sport? Is your preparation improving your activity? And only the player, in my opinion, can tell. You know, because if you feel tight, if you feel sluggish, if you feel uh, slow you're not going to perform whatever your sport is. And so that's where you, you realize, you know what, there's, I, I either need help with this or I need to cut back on some of the things that I, that I feel that I'm doing, because a lot of times people like to do what they, they want to train the way they like, not the way they need to train. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that makes any sense because no, it does. you guys that they, they, most, most of us, we do what we like, not what we need. Exactly. So, and, and I'm just thinking as a former baseball player in high school, we all did the same thing. Position players, pitchers, everybody did the same workout. And then in college, we, we had a strength coach, but all the pitchers would do the exact same workout. All the position players, you know, they would do their own specific workout. Now, when you get to the big leagues and I've had some friends that have played major league baseball and, and I, you know, from what they tell me at that level, I mean, there's nobody really making them do anything, <laughs> but their workouts were vastly different from what we would do in college. So my question for you, especially let, let's just focus on, on major league baseball players. Let's say you have a group of pitchers. One, are they all doing the exact same exercise, the exact same times during the week? And, and the same goes for position players or is every single player different and is every single player, are, are you putting on their, them on their own plan or how do you help guide them in their different uh, positions? Well, that's the benefit of the big leagues. We have more technology, more personnel to be able to evaluate the players so that we can individualize what they need. That's that is my my constant pursuit with the big leagues is to come up with the most effective ways to evaluate them so that we can prescribe exercises that are that fit them, that fit what they need. And, and not only the technology, but also my relationship with them, because it's a two-way street. As, as a major league strength coach, my initial connection with these guys is as a consultant. I present myself as someone who it wants to help them, that has experience, that has information that I want to share with them. But I realized that these guys are really good and they got their own opinions and they're grown men. And so I need the first thing that I must do is, is find a way to agree with them on what we're going to do, because what I think doesn't really matter is what they think. Mm -hmm. And if, if what they think and what I think align, then we got a program and then we can kind of get going and then we can individualize things. So not only do I have a lot of technology and I have all the bells and whistles available to anyone? But the most important thing is my initial connection with the player and my relationship with the player so that together we formulate a plan to fit their needs. Then we proceed accordingly. And so the benefit of the big leagues is like, you know, not only do I have technology, but 
and it's still kind of a you know consultant role where I mm -hmm. suggest things, we talk about it, we talk it through. It, it, it's kind of a team effort between the player and I to come up with a program. It's not so much like college or high school where you say, "Hey guys, this is the pitcher's okay. program. Get in line, let's go." Okay. It's not it's not like that at all. So they're all kind of really doing their own thing and you're there to help guide them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. With, with my with my experience, yeah, we try to draw upon all the stuff that are available to us, machines, techniques, workouts, whatever is available, we we try to put something together so that they they have something to follow week in and week out and and we we adjust accordingly but yeah we we try to my goal is always to put something together throughout spring training mm -hmm. so that when we start the season we're on the same page and 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 we go uh, okay once the season starts I, I try not to deviate too much unless they get injured but i spend all of spring training trying to get to know them try to get to mm -hmm. know what they did in the off season especially the new guys you know get to know them what makes them tick how they recover and all that stuff and then my goal is always to start the season with a program written mm -hmm. down, something specific that we could follow. Interesting. It's such a different perspective from youth sports or high school sports once you get to that level. Now, let's take, for example, let's shift gears away from professional athletes. And let's go to, let's just say your, your average Joe that, you know, it, is working a nine to five job. Most of the day they're sitting behind a desk. How important is usable strength to that person? And, and what are some of the activities they can focus on just to really keep themselves physically ready, uh, you know, healthy in shape, all of those things above. The important thing about fitness is always the goals. You know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And when you, de when you define your goals, then you have to evaluate what's my life like? What's my lifestyle? You know, do I work sitting down? Do I work standing up? Is, is my job physically demanding? Is my job sedentary? And so you, you evaluate your daily life. Where, you know, where, what do I want to improve? Do I want to improve my cardiovascular fitness? Do I want to improve my strength? Do I want to be able to play pickleball? You know, what, what, what are my goals? What are my physical goals? And so you, you got to evaluate your situation and figure out how am I going to fit a workout in my day, you know, my daily life, uh, you know, however many times a week or throughout the day or whatever. So you have to you have to start with what what I want, what do I want to accomplish? And then what is my life like? Mm -hmm. And where can I fit all this in? Then once you get past all that, then you look at the different variables of fitness. Do I need flexibility? Mm -hmm. Do I need strength do i need cardiovascular fitness you know do i have any injuries and so you look at those four areas and then you start thinking about okay so i'm i'm a person that sits on the computer the majority of the day so chances are i'm going to be very tight so perhaps every couple of hours i get up i stretch a little bit sit back down so that way i'm i'm addressing my flexibility throughout the day so I have like a like a routine a uh, several exercises or a timer where you say, okay, at 10 o'clock, I'm going to get up and I'm going to stretch for five minutes and then I'm going to sit back down. So that, that way you incorporate your, your flexibility. So I work from eight to five. Okay. So I'm going to get up at five o'clock in the morning. I'm going to work out at six o'clock shower, ready to go by seven, you know, and, and, and I go, so you make yourself a schedule of, you know, so where you can fit these things in, because if you want to get better you, you can't go by feel. Uh, the people that always tell me, ah, oh, well, I just, I just work out when I were, ever I feel like it. Well, that's too bad because I don't feel like getting out of bed most days, but I still do. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to fitness, feeling like it is never going to work for you. You have mm -hmm. to, you have to push yourself sometimes, but the preparation is what's most important. Set aside your clothes, set aside a, a schedule, uh, you know, have, have alerts on your phone, have reminders, whatever. Uh, if you, if you, when it comes to fitness, if you go with by feel, you're never going to feel like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the messages, you know, I, I keep hearing you say is, you know, there's, there's just no cookie cutter workout or 
even nutrition program for anybody. You know, we're, we're all different. We all have different goals. We all have different needs. And as you look at social media just over the past 60 days, everybody's pitching the latest diet, the latest workout program. And, you know, I think from, from the time we're, we're very young, it's just, it's drilled into our heads that you have to have this specific workout that everybody else is doing to whether it's change your physical appearance to get yourself healthy. And, and what you're saying is that's not the case. We're all different. We all have different needs and we need to evaluate those needs before we can put together a fitness program for ourselves. Yeah. Social media is a, there's a fine balance to the the benefits of social media. Uh, I, I think the value of social media, again, goes to the individual. So I look at social media as a way to get tips. I don't necessarily say I educate myself from everything I see, but I look around, I see what people are doing, and then I go back and research it a little further. So I, I look at social media for two things. I just get maybe some fitness tips, some tips on some areas that are of my life that I like and put, put family photos, you know, that's about it. But for those people that are constantly looking to get educated from social media, they're, they're going to be sadly disappointed. They're going to be running into a lot of dead ends, whether you're looking at social media for politics, religion, or fitness, Mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of uh, short, brief, tidbits of information most of them have no context and you really don't know why that person is that do is doing that exercise Mm -hmm. they put this ridiculously cut shredded good looking guy or girl Mm -hmm. and they're doing this funky exercise that (laughs) looks really really cool and what people don't realize that number one that guy may just be, number one, he might be taking steroids. Let's just kind of go there. Mm-hmm. Some of those people don't look like that naturally. You're right. Number two, they probably took years. It took them years to learn how to do that exercise from the monkey bars. And they're pulling themselves up from this and that. It probably took them years to to learn that exercise. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and And then the third part is they never tell you what this is for. All they're doing is just, in my opinion, they're just random circus acts mm-hmm. that appeal to people and, and they're entertaining and and people go out and try them and then they get hurt and they're like, oh, well, that doesn't work. Well, of course <laughs> it doesn't work because you weren't ready to do that and you don't yeah. even know how that fits your lifestyle. Yeah. It, you know, it just, it just I scratch my head when players come to me with a fitness program that they saw on, on, on social media and, and, and it's just ridiculous. I, I'll, I'll tell you a story about that. So I had a player who's very difficult, who's constantly looking at social media mm-hmm. for programs. And he, he he comes to me with with a program and he opens it up and, and I said, OK, well, let's take a look at it. And, and so I went exercise by exercise and I said, OK, this exercise, you told me last year that it hurts you. And he goes, oh, yeah, you're right. Then the next one. You said this one makes your shoulder sore. So, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't like that one. So, anyways, long story short, every exit, there was five or six exercises in that program, five of which hurt him in the past. But because it had a different name and Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know whose program it was, he, he, he wanted to try it. And when we sat and broke it down and looked at his personal medical history, it didn't fit him. Mm-hmm. But if I hadn't said that, if I hadn't sat with him and explained, broken down each exercise and why it hurt him or why it would hurt him, he would have gone and done it yeah. and hurt himself anyways. Yeah. And so and I, and I see that all the time with players that they, they fall into that rut of constantly on their phone, looking at YouTube, looking at um, Instagram for the latest exercise. And what they don't realize is that those people doing those things in those videos, it probably took them a lot of training to do that one exercise. And they're not a major league player mm-hmm. or they're not the athlete that you are, or they're not, you know, as fit, mm-hmm. or you're not as fit as them or vice versa. So it's social media can be very dangerous for the, for the person who doesn't know how to evaluate their life. Doesn't know how to evaluate what they need. 
and they don't have clear goals of what they want to do. They just they're just randomly browsing social media for the next exercise that they think that they need. You know, what's interesting is you know being around you guys uh, throughout the years, and and you you share with just a general fan, uh, you know, that these players struggle with the same things we do. And I mean, it's, it's hard to even think about that perspective that you have a major league baseball player earning millions of dollars. That's going out onto social media to look for exercises when they have all of the, all of the tools and expertise and personnel with them that can provide all that information for them. So they're no different than we are. Obviously they're incredible athletes, but they're doing the same sort of stuff that that uh, us on the outside that you know look always looking for something better. They're they're doing the same thing. Yeah, I mean they're they're human beings just like you and I. They have the same insecurities. They have the same worries and things like that. They deal with the same daily problems we all do, except they can hit a baseball and, <laughs> and throw really hard. I mean that's that's they're human beings. Sometimes we forget that those guys are human beings with feelings. Yeah, you're right. Problems just like us. And the difference is they were gifted. God yeah. gave them a gift and yeah. they were better than us, than everybody else at everywhere they went. And the select team, high school, college, yeah. minor leagues, they were just better physically, but mentally they're just like us, you know? Yeah, you're right. Now, you know, let, let's kind of start wrapping this up because my, my question for you, and, and, and again, I think, you know, just what we've talked about during this phone call you might not be able to answer this question, but really how often would someone want to commit to doing an exercise or a stretching routine? And, and really how much time should somebody carve out of their day to get through a workout? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you general guidelines that I think work for everything uh, based on what they are. So flexibility, we lose flexibility and gain flexibility every day because of the, because of different reasons, because our postures, nutrition, um but so if you want to be flexible you got to stretch every day that you know you got to find some time every day to do a few stretches at least you know the major ones whatever body parts you really need to focus on but a good 10 to 15 minutes a day you know flexibility changes day to day so flexibility i recommend you do it as much as you can but once a day every day is is what i recommend when it comes to getting strong two to three times a week, uh, depending on the types of exercises that you're doing. If you really want to get strong, you got to use the complex exercises like bench, squat, deadlift. Uh, those are the exercises that get you strong uh, the fastest. They're the most effective. They're the most researched. Uh, I feel like if you're not injured, anyone, anyone can do them under the right supervision, under the right, uh, well, with, with good technique and a good, periodized plan meaning you you change your sets and reps accordingly you can re get really strong with those exercises i recommend two to three times a week okay uh when it comes to fitness i mean our cardiovascular endurance i i read this the other day and i thought i thought that was a really good um good uh minimum standards sort of thing 180 minutes a week so however you want to break that up uh you know, so four or five times a week, 20 to 30 minutes, light cardio, light cardio, meaning conversational. So if I'm, if I'm on the elliptical, mm -hmm. can I talk to you just like I am? Mm -hmm. That is a, is a minimum standard to uh, be able to get some cardiovascular fitness for someone that is not an athlete. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that is good enough. So a, a, a light walk, a light jog, anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes three to four times a week, it, it, it gets, it gets you results. Okay. So that those are some, those are general, but, uh, and it obviously depends on the weight that you use, mm -hmm. the intensity that you use. There's all kinds of uh, different ways to, to tweak this, but I, I, I think that flexibility daily weight training, two to three times a week, cardio four to five times a week, light. So that you're not killing yourself. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's ideal. And how important is rest as part of all those plans? I mean, you know, having a rest day or, or you know, are there days where let's say, hey, my, my day off might just be a two or three mile walk um, or are there days that you should just remain sedentary? Rest is also another tricky thing because you need to be smart with the way that you evaluate your your life. I, I feel like a lot of people abuse 
rest. They're like, oh, I'm tired. I want to rest. <laughs> uh, but I feel like if you're for heavyweight training, I would rest at least a day in between. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it comes to if you're doing light cardio, like light walking every day, that I mean, I, you shouldn't require much recover from that. Mm-hmm. But if you're combining all these things and you got a, a, a really busy lifestyle, I'd say take a couple of weeks. I mean, I'm sorry, take a couple of days out of your week mm-hmm. to rest, you know, okay. to get away from the weights, to, you know, build them into the schedule. So like perhaps you work out Monday, Tuesday, take Wednesday off, mm-hmm. uh, work out Thursday, Friday, take Saturday, Sunday off, that, that kind of thing. So one to two days in between all the stuff you're doing is, is ideal. That's kind of how I've always done it um sometimes two to three days is what's required but one to two days usually gets you okay well jose i appreciate you opening up your brain and and sharing all of this excellent knowledge and advice and and leadership skills with us today before i let you go uh as part of the all me podcast we have our final section of what we call our curveball questions so these are questions that typically aren't related to your profession in 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 this instance i've actually uh, tailored some specifically to you so what i'm going to do is I'm going to ask you three questions, one by one. Uh, These aren't super heavy thought questions. Just fire out whatever comes to mind first. Are you ready? Yes. All right. The first question is, if the tables were turned and you were a ball player on the Texas Rangers, what song would we hear playing through the stadium as you approach the plate for an at-bat? New Year's Day by U2. Okay. I'll actually put a link in the show notes to that. So if people want to listen to what that is, they can. All right. Second question. As a guy who is clearly fit and your profession is based on keeping professional athletes in shape and healthy, are there any foods that you will not eat? Hmm. I mean, right now I eat everything, so that's not good. But um, <laughs> I, I would say the, the timing of what I eat, like I would not eat very heavy stuff before I worked out or, or played a game. Okay. So, yeah. Are there, are there any vegetables that you probably wouldn't eat? Oh, yeah. I, I'm not a fan of vegetables but i don't eat like uh, kale and things like that I <laughs> okay like them. i don't know who does but um yeah. all right so the, the final question is all right so you get to sit in the dugout for every texas rangers game which i know people fantasize about tell us what was the worst job you've ever had the worst job newspaper boy when i was 11 10 <laughs> years old I, I delivered newspapers in puerto rico so when you retire, you're not going to go back to throwing papers. I guess those days are kind of over anyway. But Yeah, yeah, yeah that's gone now. <laughs> well, great. Thank you again for, for being on the uh, All Me podcast, Jose. Um, it was always great visiting with you. And thank you again for sharing all your knowledge. All right. Thank you for having me. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to the All Me podcast from the Taylor Hooten Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading a national campaign to enlighten people to the truths about appearance and performance enhancing substances and inspiring people to live and compete without the use of these substances. Please be sure to subscribe to our podcast and tune in to our next episode.